and welcome to another episode of Fully Charged News. Now, every time I sift through all the news about, you know, renewable energy, electric vehicles, sustainable technology, it takes longer and longer. Which stories to skip over, which stories to include? Seven years ago, when I started making Fully Charged, you know, there was news in that arena. There wasn't very much, and most of it was speculation. Tesla might be making a saloon car. Nissan might be making a 100% electric car. Renault could be launching uh, an electric vehicle. There might even have been a story about a lone wind turbine that produced more electricity than people originally imagined. Now I have over 7,000 emails in my news inbox and I have read one or two. No, I really have, maybe five. The torrent of news from around the world about renewable energy, electric vehicles, sustainable technology is never ending. I mean, there's a new wind turbine going online in China every hour, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Energy companies in the UK are installing massive grid level batteries at substations all over the place and it's not even getting in the news. And every car maker, okay, except Fiat, but every other car maker in the world is about to launch or already has launched an electric vehicle. The discussions, the meetings, the seminars, the panels, they're, they're happening every day where people are discussing and planning ways to transition to this new technology. Cities like Paris, London, Berlin are banning internal combustion engine vehicles in the next 10 to 15 years. But the city of Oxford is going one step further. They plan to ban internal combustion engines in the, in the middle of the city by 2020. That's kind of less than three years. Oxford has a long history of trying to discourage private cars in the middle of the city. 20 mile an hour speed limits, restricted parking, loads of bikes, loads of buses. I mean, okay, the buses are still dirty old diesel things, but at least it, they're going in the right direction. It makes total sense. I mean, Oxford isn't a very big city and most of its roads are essentially medieval paths that are constantly clogged with parked cars and traffic jams. Many other cities are announcing similar plans. I've just come back from Paris where they've just announced that Paris has got the 2024 Olympic Games and the, the city authorities have said that by 2024 there will be zero cars within the centre of Paris. Now they have invested an enormous amount in an already impressive public transport system. They've installed loads of cycle lanes. There's far more people cycling around uh, Paris than there used to be. The metro of course as we all know is very good. I love the metro. You know I think it's Tris chic. Uh, it, it's a really transforming city. There are already, already 4,000 uh, car sharing electric cars from the Autolib group. There, there's 4,000 of them on the streets of Paris. They're used all the time. There are less private cars on the road in Paris. They're testing autonomous buses and they predict that most people will get to the, the Olympic Games in fully autonomous buses that are running around on the, on the public streets. Now, autonomous cars and autonomous buses, I agree, will be a kind of generational change. I mean, most people at my age are gonna freak out at the very prospect of getting in a vehicle that has no driver, no steering wheel, and no brake pedal. But if you live in a city, owning a car is already an enormous headache, an enormous burden, and a massive hassle. And if you can use transportation as easily as using your private car, or in fact, a lot easier, I think that the change will be much more sudden than we expect. So in many ways, the argument is over. The internal combustion engine is on its last legs and diesel in particular is dead. But that, let's face it, is only half the problem. I mean, there are 35 million private vehicles on the roads of the UK. If, as some non-thinking pundits like to spout, we just simply transition all those 35 million vehicles to electric vehicles, we'll have achieved nothing. The way we use cars now, regardless of how they're powered, is kind of stupid and very unsustainable. It's a blight on our towns and cities because we barely use them. I've said it many times, but it's always worth repeating. For 90% of the time, 90% of cars are not in use. They're literally in the way, taking up valuable space. Now here's a cool statistic that's come out of a recent study into autonomous cars and car sharing. Los Angeles, which let's face it, is an enormous city, has as much space dedicated to parking cars as the entire city of San Francisco. That is insane. I mean, think about what you could do with all that space if you didn't need to park all those cars. Wouldn't it be great if instead of sitting around for 90% of the time, the cars we use were in use most of the time? Wouldn't it be great if our cars, instead of just sitting around idly, were actually useful to us when we weren't driving them? 
Nissan recently announced a new electric vehicle ecosystem, which would mean you could not only drive around in your car, but you could also run your house from it. It could also charge the battery in your house and, under certain circumstances, sell electricity to the grid. The new Nissan LEAF, which we're reviewing very soon, is capable of vehicle-to-grid connections, and the possibilities this opens up are enormous. Charging your car when electricity is clean and cheap, and discharging it when electricity is dirty and expensive, helps balance the grid. Now, they've already been testing systems where the car owner would receive free electricity to drive with in exchange for allowing the battery in the car to be used as distributed grid backup. Now, offshore wind has been in the news a lot this year. For a start, the massive drop in costs per megawatt hour has sent shockwaves through the energy industry. Offshore wind is already half the cost of new nuclear that's being installed and it's getting cheaper. But how much offshore wind power could we realistically use and how many wind turbines would we need? About 3 million. A new study from the National Academy of Sciences in the United States of America has suggested that 3 million square kilometres of the windy North Atlantic would produce enough energy annually to power the entire world, the entire world in the winter and Europe and the United States in the summer. Researchers have found that up to four times more energy per square metre can be extracted from uh, open ocean wind farms than from land-based wind farms. But how on earth do you stick a wind turbine out in the middle of the Atlantic? I mean, you know, how do you put them in the deep ocean? Because I think the deep ocean is, well, it's very deep. The answer is you float them. Recently, five huge floating wind turbines were installed off the Scottish coast, producing 30 megawatts of electricity. They were supplied by Statoil, the Norwegian oil giant. Yes, an oil company with long experience installing oil rigs in harsh environments. They are transitioning to renewables. Sensible. Under the water is a 90 metre long structure weighing 3,500 tonnes, which is held in position by three suction anchors set into the seabed. Above the waterline, the turbine towers reach around 180 metres above the water level. Basically, they're massive. Many skeptics said it could not be done, but it has been done and they're operating right now. So the point I'm trying to make is don't believe the woolly-headed nonsense the fossil lobbyists go on about, oh, you can't use just renewables, you need, you need base load, all that stuff. It's nonsense. It will require ingenuity and regulatory adjustments. It will require constant political pressure from us. It will require effort and expense, but nowhere near the effort and expense that we're currently using today. But what about all the things that can't be powered by electricity, like uh, aeroplanes? When people say to me, oh, you're one of those greenies, aren't you? I have to remind them that I do fly quite a lot, I occasionally eat meat, and I'm about as green as Clarkson's arse. But that said, EasyJet, the discount airline, very popular with its passengers, uh, have recently announced that they are busy funding the development of electric passenger planes. Now, here's a reason why someone like EasyJet might want to do it. At the moment, most airports in the UK and around Europe certainly are restricted about the amount of time per day they can fly. Because when a plane takes off, everyone who lives near the runway can hear it. Well, an electric plane Unlike electric cars, which aren't silent, an electric plane is incredibly quiet in comparison with a jet engine. Therefore, they would be able to fly planes later into the evening and earlier in the morning. And they would also make massive savings in fuel. Now, can it be done? Well, we'll soon have an update on the technological uh, developments in this area. And I really believe that electric planes are not a pipe dream. The technology is leaping forward. There's enormous investment in it and enormous interest in it from all the big uh, aeroplane manufacturers around the world. And on that high note, that's all we've got time for. There's loads of wonderful episodes of Fully Charged coming your way. Uh, but before I go, I just want to say a big, big thank you to a handful of very special Patreon supporters who donate $10 a month or more towards keeping Fully Charged going. They are Christian Donovan, Simon Upton Millard, Mark Robinson, Alexa, Reese Adams, Mike Glanfield, and Richard Phillips. Thank you so much, all of you, for keeping this show going. And uh, believe me, we are working really hard not to let you down. So that's all. Uh, please do subscribe to Fully Charge if you haven't already. Please have a look at the Patreon link just casually if you've got a moment. And as always, if you have been, thank you for watching.